Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the vacuum transport seminar. Um, we're happy to welcome you tonight. So we have three interesting talks today. I give a short overview and then I'd like to hand over to Lucas, who will um, more profoundly introduce the first speaker. So as a short overview, we have uh, three talks. So the first one is by Maximilian Meyerfels. He's a master student uh, from the Technical University of Munich. Uh, afterwards, we have uh, Dr. Oliver Dehaas. He is uh, the leader of Evico GmbH. And last but not least, we have Dr. Tom Kammermeyer. Um, he's from the company Labeled. And so the first talk is uh, contributed by uh, the Technical University of Munich. So I'd like to hand over to Levente to quickly give a more profound introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie. Um, as I said, our first speaker is Maxima Meyer first. You also introduced him already. Um, we are happy to tell you that we are, we've been working on for almost one and a half years now on feasibility studies and business case um, development in our Hyperloop team. And the leader of this sub team and this whole area in our team is Maximilian, who is gonna give you a really good overview and summary of what he and his team has been doing for the uh, for the past months and uh, one and a half years. So I also don't want to spend too much time on introduction. I think Max, it's your turn now. So the stage is yours. Yeah, thanks. I hope everybody is feasible to see my screen there. Um, thanks for a nice introduction. Um, just at first, um, we did the study together, this feasibility study on the implementation of a Hyperloop system in Germany, together with my co-authors um, there. And yeah, I hope I can give you some insights, not only on the technical side, then here on the market side. And let's see how to, um, or which are the best routes there in Germany. This will be answered at the end of this small talk. Um, so to move on. So um, as we, this is the first um, presentation of our Tom Hyperloop team. I only want to give you a small overview of what we're really doing. Like on the on side, and um, you all probably know, we have this demonstrator um, we are building. And on the other side, so in the demonstrator, we are analyzing the technical feasibility um, and how to figuring out to move Hyperloop um, to reality. On the other side, we have our simulations and business case team, as well as long-term safety analysis. And here we're dealing with the long-term concept. So not only considering the next years, then for example, what will be happen in one, um, in 10 years, for example, when we are really dealing about where to build a hyperloop there. Um, so, um, so figuring out now what we really did in the past is um, a feasibility study. So the goals there were to understand the transportation industry in Germany, as well as quantify the market um, and the impact the Hyperloop system would have. And the third one would be to building their framework we could reuse the later stage because like, why should we build it in Germany? Probably because we are in Germany currently, but we want to be able to extend this framework um, on a European scale, as well as on a worldwide scale, for example, to analyze um, the best routes in Asia or North America, for example. Um, so to give you a small overview over the timeline we set ourselves was first to go into industry trends, um, industry and trends analysis. So how do we fit in there? Then on a market and route selection, so where should we go? And as a third one is a CapEx model, cost model we call it, where we say what are the initial setup costs of a Hyperloop system. And the last one and the probably most interesting one is to then calculate the economic feasibility. Because at the end, this is the last stage where we compute, for example, interesting questions on what is the ticket price? Because if we have 500 euros per ticket, probably nobody would buy it. Um, so first one we did in our industry and trend analysis is a little bit of benchmarking. So on the left side, you have the cargo case, mostly discussed in um, 
research, for example, and on the right side, you see the passengers. Um, what you can see on the left is that Hyperloop, as we expected, between 850 to 1000 kilometers per hour, um, would fit in a very similar demand scale as an airplane. This, um, as you can um, see it down there um, on the throughput on the x-axis, it's done in logarithmic scale. So therefore, most of the very common modes of transports and logistics are done, um, are done on a very slow speed, so to say, and a very large throughput. Um, we don't think that Hyperloop could provide such a throughput and therefore um, switch over here um, to the right side to the passenger analysis. The bubble size here represents the energy consumption in what hours per seat kilometer. And as you can see, the, um, we expected what will be in, for example, 10 years in a decade um, when Hyperloop would be reality. So probably we would have their air taxis on the one side or supersonic aircrafts on the other side. But for example, supersonic aircrafts, um, this, they can go very fast and connect with relatively small throughput. They have a very, very high energy consumption. Hyperloop here could fit in in this um, small green box um, where we um, see from 2,000 to 10,000 um, passengers per hour. We can't give you here a final number yet, um, but to give you an indication where we see our transport modes um, to be going in the years to come. So the key findings um, from benchmarking here is that Hyperloop cannot prove his strengths in the logistic environment. This doesn't mean we exclude it, but you wouldn't build a Hyperloop route for transporting cargo. And so our focus is here, the main one on passenger transport. Second one is the best advantages of a Hyperloop is the high speed, the sustainable energy, which is feasible um, to do. And um, third one, the urban integration and the low, low noise levels. And this is quite important because why do we have the airports outside the cities? Because nobody wants to live next to an airport because it's super loud. And what's coming, of course, are quieter airplanes in the future. Um, but Hyperloop could be integrated and you don't have um, to then add a next step in your customer journey in the travel time because all this adds up. For example, if you fly from Munich to Frankfurt, um, even though the flight time is only 45 minutes, you have your traveling from Munich city center to the airport, which is like 40 minutes and 20 minutes from Munich Frankfurt airport to the city center. So in the end, um, you have there a lot of additional um, time constraints and we always have to take a look at the whole customer journey. And the third one is this broad market we saw um, that can be tackled there in Germany. So to take here in the next step, a uh, further look into the industry and trends on the, the travel behavior, we see all over Europe and especially in Germany as well, that individual traffic in form of passenger cars are the main mode of transport. But on long-term transport as well, we see that trains and airplanes are, or buses, for example, um, are preferred by the customer itself because um, yeah, I'm not sure if you did it in the past, you can go um, for 18 hours in a car, but with a lot of stops and three different drivers. So that's no fun at all. Um, and if you go to the right side, you can see, for example, a switch. If we um, have similar travel times um, between um, on a route from Munich to Berlin, because um, there was from 2017 to 2018, there was introduced the new high speed rail. So the travel times between an airplane and the rail was very similar and the costs they charged similar as well. So people then um, moved towards rail and away from the airplane and a little bit away from the buses. And the buses in this case, of course, offers um, a lower fee to charge. And therefore you have here the very cheap segment, which still, um, goes by bus there from Munich to Berlin, Berlin to Munich. Um, so our takeaways here on the Hyperloop fit is um, the willingness to invest, especially in Germany, 
where we um, have those infrastructure plans to 2030 and additional there to the um, current planned um, budgets there are about 50 billion which are open to new projects as well as we have the year of the rail as you probably heard in europe so um, on a european scale there's a willingness to invest in new um, sustainable modes of transport as well furthermore we have this preference to go by crown um, if we have similar travel times and the third one is that um, this openness to new modes of transport can be seen in several cases in Europe and Germany. Um, if we then, in the next step, take a look in our market demand, we can see here on the left, that's at first um, the future development index. Um, we found this to be very interesting to see um, how uh, um, the Berlin Institute of Population Development um, expect the population to grow or decline inside Germany. So you can see that the south of Germany, especially around Munich and Stuttgart, um, are expected to grow the most um, because like they are considering a lot of different indexes there. Take a look if you like. Um, second one, we then build a seat metrics. In this case, for example, only a flight seat metrics. Of course, you could extend this one um, with a train seat metrics as well. And then you um, develop your flight or train corridors inside Germany. The most interesting for us were um, Munich to Frankfurt, Munich to Düsseldorf, Munich to Hamburg, and Munich to um, Berlin to be. Um, but now we have um, four interesting routes, but yeah, where to go? Because um, there's no um, Google Maps on the road, um, how to compute the distances and where to go exactly. So first on the left side, we did a horizontal plotting and then a route selection. And in this um, route selection, we then put the whole track into a small um, bits as done in civil engineering in the past very successfully. And then based on these, we do um, vertical plotting. And um, so we are able um, to consider all these constraints Hyperloop has because um, as we are going very high speeds, these constraints are quite heavy. For example, the radius of a route with high speed uh, of a curvature would be like about four kilometers. And um, then to consider you're not in a roller coaster than in a normal train, for example. Um, so these biggest constraints we have are there the landscape so tunnels, bridges, leveling, and so on, and curvatures and ramps we have to um, consider. Furthermore, we have all the service um, surface stuff. So forests, nature reserves, densely populated areas, as well as um, cities, for example, you can't go through a city with a hyperloop um, that won't be built. Um, so um, as we thought, um, we are the future and we want to uh, move onwards, we built a next routes to software, we call it. And that's an in-house software we developed. And that's at the end, we are building here Google Maps for Hyperloop. So we're able to set two points at a map and then compute um, in several steps um, the perfect routing. Um, as you can see here, from uh, um, starting from left to the right, um, we start with one route and then uh, um, develop more and more routes, always um, searching for the optimal um, routes, which um, considering costs, for example, um, tunnels you have to like tunnels you have to build, for example, are much more expensive than pillars. And through a lot of diff uh, different constraints, considering you want to have as much high speed, for example, at, along the whole route. Um, we are then about thousands of iterations later, we are feasible um, to come up with such a result, for example, um, where you can see the green spline representing um, the optimized route we would consider, for example, in this case from Munich to Berlin. Um, this is a very powerful tool and we're very proud after more than one year of development to finally have it and can use it for 
whatever you like because it's extendable to all over the world and currently we're investigating there with this route in Europe mainly. So based on these um, outputs, now we have the route and the demand, um, we can go to our capex, so our initial setup costs. Um, based on our numbers, um, we come up here between the different um, locations from Munich to Berlin, Munich Frankfurt, Munich Düsseldorf and Munich to Hamburg to different prices. And um, these prices can be of course differentiated in pods, infrastructure and tube. Tube in this case means all Hyperloop related infrastructure means vacuum pumps, um, all the power electronics and so on, what you need stations as well. And infrastructure is all not Hyperloop related, for example, tunneling and so on. Um, and pods, of course, um, the pods we de um, develop will be a very, very small amount of the initial investment. And therefore, uh, cost optimization um, should take place mainly on the tube and the infrastructure side. Doesn't make so much sense to then um, build the pods um, very cheaply because they have such a small portion of this initial investment. Um, to then move on, because we have now the costs, we have the demand. And um, therefore to compare them, um, we use here um, a deviation by the kilometers, because otherwise, if you're not doing this, you would come up with a very long route, for example, between Barcelona to Berlin to be super, um, a lot, very expensive, but you can tackle a lot of demand in this case, but um, the very high capital expenditure at the start and you couldn't weight it so easily. So therefore we divide by the numbers of kilometer of track we have to build there. And on the same thing we do on the cost side. Um, so therefore um, you can see, uh, and, and therefore you're able to compare those different routes. And as you can see here, um, the only route which has a very high yearly passenger demand per kilometer, contrary to a relatively low um, cost per kilometer expenditure start um, is Munich to Frankfurt. And therefore, in this case, we would um, recommend Munich to Frankfurt to build in Germany um, if we would be asked by a government which one to suggest. Um, and the same framework, as mentioned at the start, would be easily extendable on a European scale or go in Switzerland, for example, to analyze different routes. Um, so, um, therefore, to conclude, we see there are great potential for the implementation of a Hyperloop system in Germany. And acknowledgement of my side goes to the whole team because um, we are very interdisciplinary project and all these results we can achieve right now only work out because we are so big and so powerful. Um, to build such a software because other companies, for example, um, yeah, they might be more employees, but we are maybe a little bit more motivated and build it better. So um, thanks you and I'm open for your questions. Thank you very much, Maximilian, for the interesting insight uh, for this very futuristic aspect of Hyperloop. Um, we would like to hand over to Slido and our first question is, why is cargo not of interest? Can you explain again um, um, on slide six? Yeah, cargo is not of interest. I didn't say that. Um, like cargo is not, you wouldn't build a um, Hyperloop route because of, only because of cargo. But in the first place, if you start up a Hyperloop route, it would be, in our opinion, very smart to start with cargo transport for the first one, two years, because then if you have any accidents or any trouble, and for example, pots get stuck in the tube, you don't have so much trouble than if you have their passengers <laughs> um, somewhere in your tube and um, they could get killed or whatever. Um, this, all these things we try to avoid, and therefore this would be a first application. And in a later stage, if we have there a Hyperloop route, for example, from Munich to Frankfurt, um, and we don't use the full capacity of our system, 
Um, of course, it's planned to have their cargo pods as well, um, but they are not envisioned to have their uh, full container inside or whatever than Euro pallets, for example, because then it's easier to integrate into the normal logistics supply chain. Okay, then somebody's wondering which algorithm or optimization, so constraint, shortest path, did you use in your Routster software? We won't share this at this point in time. Like um, we did this, we did, um, like it's not only one algorithm, there are several ones, some from um, robotic engineering, for example. Um, some different network algorithms. So um, I won't go here into detail, to be honest. Yeah, we understand that. <laughs> um, then one question is, how did you include cost or costs and cost per passenger? Oh no, sorry. How did you include cost per time and cost per passenger per kilometer into the benchmarking of Hyperloop? Costs per time? Um... Like, well, it's written cost per T, so I guess time is well. Per ton, I guess. Oh, per ton, maybe. Okay. Cost per ton and costs per what was passenger that? per kilometer. Yeah, um, costs per ton. Um, we haven't like it's not included yet. Like, I'm not completely getting this question. To be honest, like how they are included into if this um, people is uh, the person is in the call would be easy if to point out what exactly you meant. Maybe the person can quickly unmute him or herself and ask the question right away. Okay, then we move on to the next, I guess. Yes, I agree. <laughs> um, then the next is, is um, what about combining cargo and person transportation on the same route? I mentioned this, like that's definitely planned. Good. But of course, you would prefer transport persons because um, there are not so many applications for um, cargo transport than for people transport, and people are much more valuable, can charge much more. And uh, so, therefore, passenger transport is the mode of transport you can make money with. Yeah. Yes. Okay, then again, thank you very much, Maximilian and Levente and like Tom Hyperloop for the contribution. It's very interesting. And then we would like to hand over to the second talk. Um, so as our second speaker, I would like to hand over to Lucas to introduce him. Yes. Thank Please you very Lucas. much. Uh, Yes, we are very much looking forward to the talk uh, from Dr. Oliver Deha. He's currently the CEO of the Evico GmbH, and they've been one of the first to work with the superconductor magnetic levitation technologies. And they have early demonstrators, they've built early demonstrators. Um, and I think this is just a very different levitation method that um, we have seen so far, from, uh, for example, from the, the transfer feed. And yeah, I'm very much looking forward to the industrial applications that uh, we will also take a look into. Um, the stage is yours. Yes, I hope that uh, you will be able to unmute yourself and then- maybe yes, yes, I'm able to unmute <laughs> and- uh, now I have to start the presentation at the same time. It's always all everything together. Just a second. Um, yeah, thank you for being here. Um, that's just taken up front. Very happy. I think now I got it. Yes, thank you. So do you see the screen now? I hope so. Yes, so yes. it's a brilliant seminar. Thank you for inviting me. I really like this kind of, uh, kind of seminar and I really like the Hyperloop idea. Uh, so I'm, I would be happy to somehow contribute to this, to this idea. And that's why I'm, 
I'm here. So as, as you already introduced me, I'm the co-founder of Avico and uh, the director of Avico. And uh, superconductivity is the DNA of our company. Uh, superconductors, this is a material which is known for having no electric resistance. It's good for, for instance, uh, power grids for motors, generators, uh, wind turbines, uh, all in uh, energy industry. But superconductors need a very, very low temperature to work. This is probably also well known. That's why cryogenics is the core know-how of a vehicle. That means all we need to do has, has something to do with low temperatures. And we are talking here about minus 200 centigrade. Not the real low temperatures at uh, close to the absolute uh, zero point, but already minus 200 centigrade. The second very important property of uh, uh, superconductors is the case is that they repel magnetic field. So this is called the so-called Meissen-Ochsenfeld effect. And this superconductor repels the magnetic field. This also means that the magnetic field repels the superconductor. It's the first step for levitation. But this would not be enough and would not be easy enough or I have a short, I have a short uh, video to just uh, explain this. You have a, can you see my mouse, the pointer? Okay, very well. You have a magnetic rail here. It's a cross section of the magnetic rail and above here a superconductor and the magnetic rail is producing a magnetic field. And this field is uh, repelled, displaced by the superconductor. And that's why we have a repelling force. Now, uh, as I said, we have a very good levitation force, but we have very little uh, guidance force, and this is not good enough. We can make use of the uh, features of the so-called type two superconductors and all high temperature superconductors, that means all temperatures, that, uh, all superconductors that work in the field of minus 200 centigrade are these type two superconductors, they let penetrate the magnetic field by so-called flux lines. And these flux lines can be pinned in the material. And this way, once you cool down the superconductor in the magnetic field, the magnetic field can uh, build in these flux lines into its structure. structure. It can pin these flux lines, and then it can keep the superconductor in its position. This is what you see here. And what's the main difference? Of course, we have uh, both. We have repelling forces, but we also have attracting forces and we have very good guidance forces. The main difference between both is, I show you on the next slide, look at the left. So the superconductor would fall down. On the right-hand side, the superconductor is still in place. So it works in all uh, orientations. And this feature is an intrinsic feature of the superconductor. All we need is just the magnetic field, that means the magnetic guideway or any other magnet, and we need a superconductor and we have to keep the superconductor cold. And how easy it is, I can show you here. This is a superconductor. This is a magnet and I just place both of them together and they hold. So we have a magnetic levitation. And if I turn it over, it still levitates. So it works in all directions independently. By the way, what you see is there is no battery inside. There is no electric power. There's no liquid meter, uh, nitrogen. It's only, a, a, let's say a cold vessel. It's called inside and a vacuum insulation around it. And it keeps here for hopefully one hour this way. Okay, this was, or is a very simple example of 
how superconducting levitation works. And this effect was discovered, let's say, 40 years ago around. And uh, people thought about what can we do, what serious things we can do with it. And the most serious things thing I won't. And the most serious thing which came across their minds at this time was building a toy train. So this little toy train is running uh, or it's working, let's say for already 25 years in this way. We made this or my, my PhD supervisor made this by the way, uh, because of a lack of money. Of course, he wanted to build a big one. Later on, we together got some money and what we built was the super trans. So the super trans is basically a driving test facility for superconducting magnetic levitation. All you need again is, I can show you here, the magnetic track. We have two magnetic tracks. They are neodymium ion born magnets uh, orientated this way. So head on magnetized and the iron yoke in between and outside. So we have a very concentrated magnetic field on both sides. And in the vehicle, you see this little blue box, blue and uh, silver box. This is the superconductor cryostat. This contains the superconductors kept cold at minus 200 centigrades. Here, used liquid nitrogen to cool down the superconductors. That's all, almost. We, of course, we have done a little bit more. Here you can see uh, <clears throat> the whole test facility. So it is a 40 meters round track or oval track. And the vehicle contains mainly or the, the most important components which are necessary for real transportation system. It means we have two braking systems, we have a propulsion system, we have energy trans transfer to the vehicle. You see this two wires here, and this is an inductive energy transfer to the vehicle. And the propulsion, maybe you can see this, if I get, go back to the previous slide, here you can see it better. This is a simple double layer structure, copper and iron. And this works as a reaction rail for the linear motor we have built in. And of course, a control system. And we could control this vehicle remotely, but also from on board. So this was a nice piece and toy. And on this, we studied, not we, but our colleagues from the Institute studied all these technologies. Avico just has built this. Some features, I already told you the track length was 40 meter and I go back, the maximum speed 20 kilometers per hour. Wow, this is really fast. It's fast indeed. Look at the curve radius, 6.5 meters. Once you go 20 kilometers per hour on such a low radius, it feels really fast. And that, so it has the feeling of a real Formula One race car because of its high uh, vertical forces you feel. So this is 20 kilometers per hour is really fast for this small track, but uh, for the small guideway, but there's no limit in maximum speed for this technology. Okay, so the interesting thing about this is we have, a, we have a motor there, but more interesting is once you switch off the motor and just someone tries to give the vehicle a little bit of push and then you wait how long it runs before it gets stopped. And we, we made this with a very, uh, let's say light push and not reaching this 20 kilometers per hour and we counted the rounds and we had 13, 13 rounds before finally the air friction made the vehicle stop. That means we have absolutely no friction in the levitation system. Only the air friction is 
uh, working and finally stopping this car. Let's have a short look underneath the cover. Under the cover, here you again you see this four superconductor triastats. We have 12, 24 so-called YPCO bulks, means it's a kind of a small brick. Small brick means 100 millimeter by 30 millimeter by 15 millimeter, it's dimension. We have 24 of these bulks in each of the cryostats. They are cooled with liquid nitrogen, it means they operate for about 24 hours before they get warm and they need each of them about a quarter of a liter of liquid nitrogen. This is very little. The maximum load of all this together is 8,000 Newton. That means if we would put them together, this dimension is about 50 centimeter, a bit less, we would have on total 8,000 Newton per meter levitation load or levitation force. And it means for 10 meters car, it would be possible to have eight tons to levitate. So this technology would also work for high loads. Well, now I want to make the, the jump to the Hyperloop and maybe I go back to this slide. Do you remember I said what I said about the air friction? We have absolutely no friction in the system beside the air friction. How can we get rid of the air friction? I think all of you know the answer. Uh, the answer for me is clear. If we have this hyperloop idea, the air friction is, we also lo lose the air friction and we have the ideal system. I made a comparison of one uh, uh, hyperloop levitation system, the so-called Indoctrack, because it is the favorite system uh, of Hyperloop GG. This is a basic principle of the Indoctrack uh, levitation system. Maybe all of you know it. Here we have the tube, we have the car body, and very simplified some magnets here on the car. This could also be superconducting magnets to increase the, the magnetic force, the magnetic flux. And we have a metal sheet or some, uh, something electrically uh, conducting. And by eddy currents, uh, repulsive forces, fields are generated, which, which finally uh, let the body levitate. And this uh, eddy currents, they have ohmic losses. And ohmic losses means we already, we again have a friction in the system because the losses here, they have to be taken from the propulsion system. My question is, why do we make such a big effort to get rid of the air friction when we finally use a system which again introduces friction in the system? I took a quite old paper uh, you can see the source here. It is taken from, from the internet. It's not a published paper, but it was at this time the only uh, source I had and uh, I didn't make, much, uh, didn't make much effort to get new sources, honestly. At this time, there in this, in this paper, I found a diagram showing force, drag force and uh, lift force over different speeds. And by multiplying both forces, um, the force, the drag force by, uh, with, with the speed, you get an energy consumption. And for different speeds, I made just three points. I got 36 kilowatts per ton up to 91 kilowatts per ton energy consumption for levitation. This is quite a lot. I again want to mention, this is not the newest work, and I know there are much more, much better solutions already, also for this Induct-Track technology, but this is the only reference I have at the moment. This is a superconductor cryostat as we uh, have it, which is nearly uh, ready to market. This has a payload of 150 kilograms. 
power consumption of 75 watts. And this is uh, industry ready almost. That means the vacuum lifetime is in, in the range of 20 years or more and the cryo cooler lifetime is 14 years. Cryo cooler, why? Because we don't use liquid nitrogen anymore. We want use electrically cooled uh, system. That means superconducting magnetic levitation in comparison to the source I have, again, has 99% less power consumption, 99% less heat generation in the vacuum tube, and no wheels for liftoff. Of course, it adds some additional costs infrastructure costs, I would say in the range of 2,000 to 3,000 euro per meter for the magnetic rails. My question to the auditory, for, your, for the technology you're working on, I know that there are different technologies, uh, uh, different groups are working on what energy consumption do you have for your technology? And what concepts do you have to get rid of the heat in the vacuum tube? How to get rid of the, the heat in your system? So this is what I have for Hyperloop. I would change to the next interesting uh, topic. And this is something I really love about my job and about this technology that it fascinates people and it let them have crazy ideas and they come to us and approach us with their crazy idea. And one of these crazy ideas or one of these people were an uh, advertisement company called CHI and Partners from London. They came to us and asked, can you make a hoverboard? We have seen your super trans technology, can you make a hoverboard? Well, it's difficult. Yes, and we want to make it jump and we want to make all the stunts, all the, the people, the skaters, the cool skaters and the skate parks too. Well, probably not. Remember one of the first slides, the super the, the magnet is completely fixed relatively to the superconductor. That means you cannot take it out. So we did not expect it, that it would be possible to jump. We started into a perfectly nice and creative project. This is the Supratrans uh, hall, Supratrans uh, facility here. Uh, everything was dismantled and the first prototype of the hoverboard is here, made from wood. And here you see already a slope for the, uh, yeah, for the first tests on how much speed you would get on this ramp. Remember, no friction and each half a meter would add about 15 kilometers per hour speed. So this is quite a high speed already. Again, the first prototype, and you see how simply the magnetic rails were attached to each other. Again, the first test ride, and here again, this ramp for testing. We, by, by the way, had an ambulance waiting outside for the first two weeks. This pro skater made the tests on the hoverboard. Then it came to a design work because they wanted to have it beautiful and slim. And they wanted to do all these stunts I told you. This is how the hoverboard finally, hoverboard finally looks like. We have this superconductor plates here. We have two containers for liquid nitrogen. This is a, this, the whole board is based on a foam, on a hard form a basis. And then we had to uh, laminate it and in, reinforce it because uh, this, we, we were used with, uh, to work with uh, somehow sensitive instruments or some, somehow yeah, sensitive uh, materials. And now they wanted to have it slim and they wanted to really work with it on the skate park. So and this is what, what came out. And I show you uh, the pictures finally uh, from this uh, advertisement campaign. This is, was a very successful campaign made for Lexus and uh, made for this by this uh, CHI and 
partners company in London. And it was a really, really good uh, experience for us. May I ask how much time I have? I don't see it here on my, I think I, I'm almost over with my time. Yes, I guess so. <laughs> yes. So I would skip uh, all the industrial applications, maybe just give you a sh very short. Uh, yeah, just a little, yeah. Okay, maybe just one example. This is one industrial application we are working on with the Festo company, which is an automation industry automation company. And they have present here a solution for balance, which could work in a laboratory. And what you see is the, the, uh, the plate where, where the weight is put on is completely separated from the balance underneath. That means you can, you can uh, work with your very sensitive or even dangerous goods in a uh, completely uh, hermetically sealed room without having any electronics or sensors in this room. We have many other industrial applications we are working on, just a few pictures on this. And then I would say thank you very much. And think about the questions I have asked to you. I would really love to discuss this with you. And another question I want to ask you, how would you make use of this technology? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Duhaus. Um, I like to part with the crazy ideas and I think we can now check if there are also some crazy questions from the audience. So the first question is, the high temperature superconductors have very bad mechanical characteristic. To use these ceramic materials in a transportation environment seems not to be realistic. Will this not simply remain a nice demonstrator? I think I have shown I have given the answer with the hoverboard project. Yes, these are ceramics and yes, they are a bit sensitive, but not so, not really sensitive. Not here anymore. No, they are, it's okay. It's easy to work with it and it's absolutely no problem to put them in a transportation system. Okay, then somebody's wondering, could you, could you today cool down the superconductors just electrically? Yes, we can. Maybe this was a bit fast. Uh, I showed you the superconductor cryostat, which has a payload of about 115 kilograms, and this was completely electrically cooled. And uh, so it is a plug and play uh, system. It needs 70 watts electrically pow electric power. And then we have the system I showed you at the beginning. This is also electrically cooled. So this is, does not contain liquid nitrogen. It's just, we keep the cold, the cold inside. We do not let, get the heat in. This is the trick. And this keeps, holds for about one or one hour or 90 minutes, something in between. Okay, and then one last question. How costly is building such a magnetic guideway or track? Yeah, this is, this is the crucial point. It, is, uh, it, varies, it strongly depends on the market price of neodymium iron boron magnets. So this is not rocket science to mount the, the guideways. The, the really difficult thing or difficulty is the price of the neodymium iron boron magnets. And what I said before, we would have to take into account 2,000 to 5,000 euro per meter double track to levitate up to one ton per meter. All right. Um, good. So thank you very much, Dr. Dehaus. It was very interesting insight. Thank, thank you for you the contribution. Much. Thank you. Thank you. And then we would like to get to our last speaker today, which is um, Dr. Tom Kammermeier. And I would quickly like to hand over to Levente to give a, a short but more deep introduction. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, so as the last speaker of today, we are glad to welcome Dr. Tom Kammermeier uh, from the company Labord. Labord is, uh, I think also very really famous for for vacuum technologies, and they are, and they have been for a long time, also a great supporter of the Tum Hyperloop team. 
Um, that's why I'm also really happy to welcome him today. And I'm looking forward to presentation, which, which is going to give uh, a short overview over the vacuum technology for Hyperloop tubes. So I think the stage is yours and thank you very much again. Yeah, thank you for this introduction um, and uh, for this invitation for this talk. So um, I will quickly share my screen so that you all see the presentation, hopefully. So, yes. So, okay, I guess now it works. I think you see the full screen now, right? Yeah, it's working. Okay, perfect. Thanks. So again, thanks for this invitation. So I want to give you, uh, yeah, for the next uh, 15 minutes, a brief uh, overview, or let's say more spotlights about the vacuum technology and about the considerations with regard to uh, Hyperloop. So, um, so, okay, let me see. Should change. Ah, yeah, perfect. Okay, here I'm uh, sure you've seen this already. Um, that's the idea to have evacuated tubes. And um, personally, I love this picture down here in the left lower corner. So where you see a kind of uh, yeah, <laughs> urban rail system across the world. You see this is already from 2008, even before Elon Musk triggered this enormous hype of Hyperloop. And um, yeah, I think it's a great vision. And of course, for a vacuum supplier, it's a very, very interesting vision. So to connect the world by uh, thousands of kilometers of uh, evacuated uh, pipes. So, but where are we today? So today we have one system of, uh, I think it's about 500 meters. So where lately the first people really run inside uh, the vacuum, inside a pot. So. So there's some more to, to come with regard to the vision. And um, of course, we as a vacuum supplier, we have to think about uh, what, uh, what to do in the future. So, and um, first of all, you might think about pumping principles. There are many, many pumping principles. And um, from the beginning, it's not quite clear which one um, you should use for, for a hyperloop. So there are claw wax, uh, <coughs> scroll pumps, rotary vein pumps, turbo pumps, root pumps, diffusion pumps, all, even cryo pumps and membrane pumps. Uh, many, many different principles that have developed over the years. And um, okay, what what to choose for a for a hyperloop tube? So you have to ask two important questions, and the one is what is what pressure do you need, and in what time do you want to um, get to this pressure? So, and this uh, accounts for the pot that will be introduced into the pipe into the tube, but also for the pipe itself, of course. If there is maintenance, you need to pump it down. And uh, this shouldn't take years, of course. And then there is the question, how much gas needs to be pumped? Because the, the, at the operation point of the Hyperloop, there will be always a certain leak flow, some gas coming from the outside uh, into the pipe. And this needs to be pumped away by the pumps. So, and here you see roughly the expected Hyperloop operational range. Honestly speaking, we've got requests even in a bigger range, but uh, I think this is the most likely range where it will work in the end. Um, certainly, uh, we will need big pumps and not every pump principle um, is suitable for 
for um, for this huge pumping sizes. So this is a plot where you see a kind of hyperloop dilemma, because on the one hand, you want to pump down a big tube. On the other hand, you want to maintain the tube at a certain operation pressure. And uh, if you think of the limit, if there's a perfectly sealed tube, then you hardly need any pumping speed, but you need a lot of pumping speed to pump it down. And this then means a big mismatch. And what you see here in this, this colorful plot is basically uh, for, for a 10 kilometer tube, which should be operated at 10 Pascal. We have uh, calculated results for different leak flows. So here it's a leak flow in norm cubic meters per hour and uh, requested pump down time to this operation pr uh, pressure. And here you see if you, if you invest a lot into the uh, leak tightness of your system, but you, um, but you want to have a short pump down, then you end up somewhere here. And this means that uh, just eight per mil of your pumps are needed at the operation point, which then is certainly very bad with regard to the, um, to the invest that you need to do. Let's talk a bit about local leaks. So um, typically the, the leak rate uh, across the pipe, uh, it will not be homogeneous. However, a lot of small leaks will sum up to some kind of background. This is what I've considered before, some, some uh, background leakage, which needs to be pumped away by the pumps, but uh, there might be also local leaks. And this is also uh, quite important with regard to safety. And uh, when you size a vacuum system, you have to think about the impact of these local leak rates and especially on the impact on the Hyperloop's uh, aerodynamic. So saying aerodynamic, uh, even at this low pressure, there's some aerodynamic even though the gas density is very low. But this is the, the interface for us to the Hyperloop companies because they, they don't tell us details. They just give us specifications what, what they like to have and what they can, um, <clears throat> what they can accept. And um, here, this is actually a plot which is uh, which you can find in most of the physics books, uh, which shows you the the gas density, the so-called Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution for different gases um, at ambient temperatures, and uh, here you see something which is really um, yeah one can say unique for huge hyperloop systems. Um, the the uh, gas velocity is so low that you will you will um, trigger or you will uh, detect a leak, which is quite remote. You will uh, need several seconds. The gas will need before you will see it at your pressure gauge. And basically you can say that every kilometer um, is one second, which, uh, which the gas simply needs to go to your uh, pressure gauge, and that's that's something which uh, <clears throat> which you don't find in any other um, vacuum chamber in the world. So let's talk about the the impact of uh, local leaks. I told you before there will be a kind of background leakage and the pumping speed will equal, equalize this uh, leak, uh, leakage at the operation point here, for example, at 100 uh, Pascal. So, and then you will have local leaks which might develop 
due to some corrosion, due to some accident, whatever. And uh, the impact can be quite, uh, quite different. And the tricky part is, of course, to consider the homogeneous leak flow about what I call background leakage, uh, then the pumping speed requirement that you need for this uh, leakage, then the impact that local leaks will have, and of course, your desired operation pressure. And all this comes into play when you think about distributing your pumping stations, because the most desirable, most or cheapest solution would be, of course, just to put one big pumping station and then to, uh, <clears throat> to pump down the whole pipe. But uh, this clearly has some downsides with regard to the press pressure distribution. And here you see another calculated example, uh, a track of 60, um, <clears throat> 64 kilometers, diameter of four meters. So, and we consider just some perfect hyperloop pump with this kind of pumping speed. So we calculated about hundreds uh, of them. And then you see that if there is a leak at the most remote side of um, here at the other end of the pipe, you will have about 18% pressure increase along the pipe. And this, this is simply due to the, the conductance and uh, also the, the, the gas velocity that I've mentioned before. So there will be this, uh, this pressure increase and again, what does this mean for the for the aerodynamics of the hyperloop pot? This needs to come from the from the hyperloop companies, and this here is calculated for a, for a perfect straight pipe with zero roughness. And if you go more, uh, if you just make a little uh, deviation from this perfect pipe. Then, uh, like here, we consider a narrowing by 2.5 centimeter. Then this effect rises already to 22 percent. And um, yeah, this of course uh, is uh, very important for the companies uh, to take into account. And I show you on the next page. Um, here you see. Uh, the same calculation, but now we have placed the pumping speed, or we have split the pumping speed into two pumping stations, which are separated by 32 kilometers. Um, are by, no, sorry, they are separated by 64 kilometers, but the leak is in the middle. So the, the distance to the leak is 32 kilometers. And here you see already you have clearly a damping of this effect. So there's not a lot of pressure rise and you can clearly reduce the, the impact of such a local leak. If you, of course, you can go to a even finer grid of pumping stations. Here it's done for uh, just 20 of this perfect hyperloop pumps. Um, and you see that you have more or less a straight line with regard to the pumping speed. And you are much more uh, resilient against uh, these uh, kind of local leaks. So before I've, uh, <clears throat> I've mentioned perfect pumps, so what are, what are the real pumps that we consider? So first of all, there need to be uh, so-called four pumps. These, these pumps are used to compress the air up to atmospheric pressure. So from low pressure up to atmospheric pressure, um, these pumps are very important for your, your pump down time. There are basically two technologies nowadays uh, established, uh, which is uh, either the, the dry screw technology or the wet rotary vane technologies. So um, these pumps, what they all have in common is that their uh, pumping speed is basically the, the volumetric flow is fixed by geometry. 
you have a certain suction volume and this is fixed and you can, okay, you can turn the pump faster, but at a certain uh, speed of rotation, this is all fixed. And with regard to the operation point of a hyperloop, it's very desirable to have some kind of pre-compression. And for this, we think the roots blower um, are really uh, the perfect pump at the expected uh, operation pressure of a hyperloop. These pumps, they have a, a high volume flow and they can pre-compress the gas for the four pumps. And uh, this can reduce your energy consumption and the, the amount of four pumps that you need um, quite drastically. And uh, from an energetic point of view, uh, this is clearly favorable. favorable. <clears throat> and um, yeah, you might see different four pumps, but um, with regard to the roots pump, uh, I would say I'm basically sure that this pumping technology will be part of Hyperloop systems. And finally, uh, let me mention that there's much more under consideration and uh, that needs to be discussed. So uh, for example, it's from an energetic point of view, it's nice to have water cooled pump. So you can make uh, pumps more, <clears throat> more efficient if you work with cooling water, but it's of course an additional uh, effort to bring the cooling water to the pumps. And if you think of a remote uh, pumping station somewhere in the desert, it might be also uh, interesting to have some air cooling. The electricity supply, of course, uh, there's the idea to equip the, the Hyperloop with solar cells. So then uh, we have to think about different motors because solar cells, they don't produce uh, the AC uh, current that's needed. Serviceability, of course, um, if you make a big pump, then it will be very difficult to move this out and uh, to replace it. Or if you have small pumps, you need a lot of them. Um, yeah, logistics that <clears throat> comes along with this. Um, then there's resistivity to dust, humidity, water. You can uh, build pumps like this in a, an enclosure, um, but uh, all this costs, of, of course, money. And uh, you either invest in this kind of pumps or you have to invest in the, in the shelter for the pumps. So, um, and of course, uh, ambient conditions in general. So uh, the typical industrial vacuum pump nowadays uh, is specified for five to 40 degrees C. And uh, this will for sure change if you think of remote pumping stations uh, at, um, at a Hyperloop. So, and uh, yeah, of course for us, this is very interesting because uh, the vacuum supplier who addresses this, uh, these questions uh, best, uh, yeah, <laughs> will, will, <laughs> will make the business. <laughs> so, and with this, I'm at the end of my talk. And uh, there's, oh, sorry, I forgot this one more slide. Basically it's double, I guess, sorry for this. Okay, but with this, I'm at the end and I'm looking forward to the questions. So, hello. Yes, yes, thank you very much, Dr. Kammermeyer, for the interesting talk. Um, we would like to head over to the questions and also due to time reasons, I think we don't have time for so yeah, many. Quickly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, okay, so. I would say the biggest question is, do you think that having two tube walls instead of a single one would be beneficial in terms of leakage? This way the pressure jumps would be smaller. Uh, good question. This is what is done for um, pretty low pressures. So uh, there's a big discussion ongoing which material to use for the, for the tubes. Um, and um, 
I think uh, we won't see a double a double walled uh, hyperloop tube. I don't think this. I think you can make materials uh, tight enough so that you don't need it. All right. All right, good to know. And then one last question is, um, how much energy do you need for, for example, one kilometer of four meter diameter tube at one millibar? Yeah, this is, uh, I can't answer this question because this is exactly what I've shown before. If there's a lot of leakage, you will need a lot of energy consumption. Yeah, and if you have a perfectly sealed pump, then once you are at the operation pressure, you can basically switch off uh, most of your pumps. And this is what we are working on. This is uh, this pump distribution, this optimization of the pumping system so that we can really address the, the uh, operation pressure of uh, hyperloops. So there's no, no easy answer. So a lot of leakage means a lot of energy consumption. Low leakage means hardly any energy consumption. All right, yes, that makes sense. Okay, um, then I think we would round this up. Thank you very much, Dr. Kammermeyer, for your insight and the talk. And yeah, and I would like also to big, over uh, to Fabio. <laughs> Also, a big thank you from my side. Thank you very much to all the speakers and the interesting talks and sharing the latest technology from their end. Uh, next time, the fifth session of our vacuum transport seminar in this spring 21, we have again three speakers and we will hear about business models of sustainable long distance transport. We will hear about the thermal analysis of um, cryostats for high temperature superconductors, which we also encounter today in the second talk. And last but not least, we will also have a look at linear motors, linear electric motors, their topologies and configurations when it comes to their application in Hyperloop propulsion systems. So join us again next week. Tune in. Um, yeah, see you there. Bye bye. again. Especially Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Goodbye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.